In this video, we continue the series of going over some main deck monsters and explaining why they're banned, including some pendulum monsters and some old school cards for this video. First up, let's go over Performer Pal Monkey Board. This is a pendulum monster with a scale of 1, and the only thing that really matters about this card is its pendulum effect, which allows you to add a level 4 or lower pendulum monster from your deck to your hand. You can only use this effect during the turn that it's activated, and it's also a hard once per turn. In addition, this card scale becomes 4 if you do not have a Performer Pal monster in your other pendulum zone. Now, what's really important about this card is that it basically allows you to set up your scales with a single card and doesn't archetype lock you for doing so. You see, one of the things that kind of balances pendulum monsters to an extent, as they can allow you to basically special summon every card from your hand and some from your extra deck if you have the zones available, is that you need to have two cards on the field that have opposite scales. So if you start off with five cards in your opening hand, the most you can summon from your hand is three monsters if you need to use two of the monsters from your hands that have opposite scales. And the important thing is that opposite scales part because pendulum monsters all have predetermined scales on their card. So there's a chance you could just draw a whole bunch of scale one pendulum monsters and not be able to use any of them to actually pendulum summon the others. So cards which are able to change their scales to a different number are very valuable like the Yosenju Pendulum Monsters, for example. And cards that allow you to search out other Pendulum Monsters unconditionally are also pretty powerful because it allows you to search out the opposite scale to a scale that you might already have in your hand or already set up on the field. Which is part of the reason why Heavy Metal Foe's Electromite is banned, because it allows pretty much any Pendulum deck the ability to search out any Pendulum Monster they want so that you can much more readily set up your scales. And there's even a card called Pendulum Call, which requires you to discard one card in order to activate it, but you're able to add any two Pendulum Magician monsters from your deck to your hand with different names. Which allows you to set your opposite scales with one card from your hand, and a discard. And Pendulum Call was so good, it was actually limited on the ban list for a while. So you might be seeing a pattern here with all of these really good Pendulum support cards. Being able to set up scales is a balancing factor of Pendulum monsters. So, Perform Pound Monkey Board, by itself, allows you to set up both of your scales without bothering with any of those other support cards. If you have a starting hand of 5 cards and one of them is Perform Pound Monkey Board, then you can special summon those other 4 cards, by just searching out an appropriate opposite skill when you activate Monkey Board, since there are a ton of Pendulum Perform Pound monsters. Perform Pal 5 Rainbow Magician has an opposite scale of 12, although only allows you to pendulum summon monsters from the extra deck. Perform Pal Odd Eyes Unicorn has an opposite scale of 8, which allows you to special summon monsters between the levels of 2 and 7, which is a majority of the monsters in the game. Or if you're just playing a whole bunch of level 4 monsters, which is even more common, you have the option of Perform Pal Lizard Draw, which has an opposite scale of 6, and has the effect where it can destroy itself in order to draw one card, just as long as you have another Perform Pal monster in the other pendulum zone. So Monkey Board could search out Lizard Draw. Lizard Draw could be used with Monkey Board in order to pendulum summon your monsters. Then afterwards, Lizard Draw could destroy itself to allow you to draw one card. Alternatively, Performer Pal Guitardo could be used to the same effect. So Performer Pal Monkey Board could be used in order to search out a pendulum scale in any deck, which is another distinction that matters because there are other pendulum cards which can set up their own scales as well. If we take a look at Cleefort Scout or Abyss Actor Mellow Madonna, these are two pendulum monsters that are able to search out an opposite scale from their own archetype. However, they both have a restriction where you can only special summon monsters from their archetype, whereas Monkey Board has no such restriction, and has a ton of search targets that also have no such restrictions. So, they can be played with pretty much any deck, and was especially useful in decks that made use of Performer Pal monsters, and even had some other support cards which allow you to plus even further, which I might stress were not necessary to make Performer Pal Monkey Board strong. Monkey Board exists as kind of a lone pendulum monster who allows you to set up both of its scales by itself while also being one of the scales and not restricting your special summoning to its archetype. And as a bonus, without having to have any kind of special summon condition or a card on the field, it doesn't even have a cost, whereas Madonna and Scout both require you to at least pay life points to activate their searches. The fact that a lot of the cards Monkey Board can search out can also search out other cards or even gain more advantage was just kind of icing on the cake. Without the availability of going into Lizard Draw, Guitardle, Skulkerbat Joker, Winds of My Magician, or Sorcerer, it would still be good if all those other five cards didn't exist in the game. The fact that it can search out five other cards that allow you to gain more advantage is kind of the reason why this card has stayed banned for so long. Before Power Monkey Board came out in 2016, was limited on the ban list very shortly after it came out, then banned in August of 2016 where it has stayed banned to this day. The fact that there was a deck that had both Monkey Board and Perform Mage plus Fire in at the same time 
both of which were illegal at three copies, is kind of insane, as these are two of the strongest pendulum monsters ever made. And I'd argue Perform Age Plush Fire is just one of the strongest cards ever made. And it's no wonder that Perform Age Performer Pals were a tier zero deck. Could Perform Pal Monkey Board be unbanned? With the changes of Master Rule 4, where you no longer summon pendulum monsters from the extra deck to a zone, unless it's the extra monster zone or a zone a link monster is pointing to, they are definitely heavily limited compared to how they were pre-Master Rule 4, and after the Master Rule 4 revisions, they kept their restrictions, while the Synchros, XCs, and Fusion Monsters had their restrictions lifted. So with a more stringent summoning restriction on Pendulum Monsters, Monkey Board is still too strong because it allows you to set up your own scales generically. It doesn't even matter that Pendulums are still limited, because Monkey Board is still as strong on turn 1 as it was back in the day. It's just no longer strong in the grind game. Nothing about the restrictions really stop Monkey Board from being powerful, other than lowering the power level of Pendulums on a whole. So it will probably stay banned unless Konami starts printing out a whole bunch of other cards that are able to sub their own scales as well, without locking you out of summoning other types of monsters, where Monkey Board might just fit in with this new overpowered meta. How could Perform Pound Monkey Board be fixed to be unbanned? If they gave Monkey Board a restriction where you could only special summon Performer Pound Monsters for the rest of the turn after you activate its effect, that might be enough to fix the card. It would still be powerful support within the Performer Pal archetype, but you wouldn't be able to play a whole bunch of other Pendulum Monsters and only the Performer Pals. Now, there are a ton of Performer Pal Monsters in the game, so even this might not be enough to fix it because there's probably some broken combo I'm not even thinking of, but the main reason this card is banned is because of its generic availability of setting up its own scales and not locking you into its archetype while doing so. Next up, we have another Pendulum Monster. This time, we have Lunalite Tiger. Just like with Monkey Board, the reason Tiger is banned is because of its Pendulum effect. Where, while this card is on the field and treated as a spell card, it has the effect where once per turn you can special summon any Lunalite monster from your graveyard, but its effects are negated and it can't attack and it's destroyed during the end phase. Which doesn't matter because you can just use that monster as a material, and a lot of Lunalite monsters have effects that activate when they're sent to the graveyard anyway. And what's really important about Lunalite Tiger is the fact that its effect is only a soft once per turn, and within its own archetype it has a card called Lunalite Yellow Martin which can special summon itself from your hand or graveyard by returning a Lunalite card you control from the field to your hand. But the card then banishes itself when it leaves the field. So, you could use Lunalite Tiger to special summon a monster from the graveyard, which by itself is already a plus one in card advantage. Then return it to your hand with Yellow Martin in order to fulfill its cost of special summoning itself, where you can then just activate Lunalite Tiger again, and immediately use its effect for another plus one in card advantage. And what do you know, since the effect is only a slot once per turn, if you're also playing a card like maybe Blackwing Zephyros the Elite, and then just activate that card for another plus one in card advantage for another special summon. Since the good effect of this card is on its pendulum effect, and you can activate spell cards as many times as you want per turn, which includes just activating a pendulum monster into one of your pendulum zones, the more you can return this card to your hand, the more you gain the plus one in card advantage. And the fact that its archetype has a card that allows you to reuse the effect, this is just asking for all kinds of abuse. There are actually a lot of archetype specific cards that allow you to special summon monsters from the graveyard, like Dark Lord Contract for example, but some of those cards have hard ones per turns on them, and most of them are spell cards that go to the graveyard immediately after you use them, so they don't require hard ones per turns. Because it's infinitely harder to reuse a spell card which does not stay on the field. And Lunalite Tiger gives you all of the advantages of those archetype specific Monster Reborn cards while being usable every turn and even loopable on the same turn. There is other continuous spell cards that allow you to special summon monsters from the graveyard just like Lunalite Tiger, as you can see with Predaponyx for example. This is a continuous spell card which allows you to special summon a level 4 lore Predator Plant monster from your hand or graveyard, but its effects are negated. It only has a soft once per turn and has a maintenance cost and is currently unlimited in the game without any problems. The difference between Lunalite Tiger and Predaponyx is 1. Lunalites are a better archetype than pure Predaplants, and 2. If Lunalite Tiger is destroyed before it's able to use its Pendulum effect, it activates its monster effect where if it's on the field and destroyed by battle or card effect, you get to special summon a Lunalite monster from your graveyard, but without any restrictions on that monster. So you can stop a Predaponyx with a Mystical Space Typhoon if you chain it to the activation of the use of the card. But if you try to do the same thing to Lunalite Tiger, it then activates its monster floating effect where it will still special summon a monster anyway. So it has a loopable effect and a floating effect and could use both of them on the same turn. And you could even proc both of them yourself. But funny enough, its floating effect is a hard once per turn, unlike its more abusable pendulum effect, which is kind of backwards. Lunalite Tiger was banned in April of 2020. Could Lunalite Tiger be unbanned? The answer to this question is maybe. 
Despite how good the card is, the effect is tied specifically to an archetype and it's not a generic advantage like Monkey Board for example. Lunalite Tiger will only ever benefit Lunalite decks, so its power level is entirely dependent on how strong those Lunalite decks are. So if Lunalite ever got power crept into uselessness, then Lunalite Tiger could definitely come off the ban list and might not even make the deck good enough to compete with whatever is currently running around in the meta. Cards can kind of be stronger than normal when they're restricted to an archetype. And in fact, there are a lot of very strong cards in the game currently that probably should be banned, but are not because they're only really good within a specific archetype, like Sky Striker Mobilize Engage or the Phantom Knights of Rusty Bardiche. Both of these cards allow you to gain way more advantage than a normal card really should be able to, and both of them were even banned at one point, but they eventually came off the ban list and weren't too big of a problem, because that advantage is tied to a specific archetype. How could they fix Lunalite Tiger to be unbanned? If they simply gave its pendulum effect a hard once per turn, rather than a soft once per turn, that would do it. Next up we have Jin Releaser of Rituals. This is a level 3 Dark Fiend monster, so it can be searched out of the deck with 2 guy from the Underworld, and has the effect that, if you Ritual Summon a monster, you can banish this card from your graveyard as one of the materials. Additionally, if this card is used as materials for the Ritual Summon of a monster, your opponent cannot Special Summon monsters while you control that Ritual Summon monster face up. So it basically grants a lingering effect to any ritual monster that is equivalent to Vanity's Ruler, which is a very strong Floodgate monster that has seen a lot of competitive play in the past precisely because of its effect to disallow your opponent from special summoning monsters. Even though the card itself has a restriction where it can't be special summoned at all, and you have to waste two tributes in order to bring this card out normally. There's also a trap card called Vanity's Emptiness, which has the continuous effect where neither player can special summon any monsters, but it's also incredibly fragile. And the fact that if any card is sent from your field or deck to the graveyard, it will destroy itself immediately. Shutting down your opponent's special summons is a very powerful effect. One of the best floodgates you can have, or even something that has a whole bunch of built-in restrictions to that floodgate effect and affects both players is considered too strong to be in the game. However, Jin release of Rituals was fine for a really long time, as this card came out in 2009, and it wasn't banned until 2015. And the reason the super powerful Floodgate was allowed to exist in the game for 6 years uninterrupted is because it only applied its effect to Ritual Monsters, and Ritual Monsters are kinda garbage. Rituals have to be one of the most failed type of monsters they've ever added to the game, and is so inherently clunky and unplayable that they could kinda print any kind of support they wanted for Ritual Monsters and it wouldn't matter because they just weren't very good. But then, in 2015, the Necroz archetype was released. This is an archetype of ritual monsters that finally solved the problem of how to make ritual archetypes not useless. And the way they solved the problem was by giving all of the ritual monsters hand effects, in addition to just basing their effects on the field on really strong synchro monsters of the past. And in fact, Necros were such a successful ritual deck that they even managed to attain tier 0 status for like one event, and just normal tier 1 status across the board when they were at full power. And one of their main playmakers was a level 3 ritual monster. Necroz of Colossus is a level 3 ritual monster which has the effect where you can discard this card from your hand in order to add a Necroz spell or trap card from your deck to your hand. And Necroz also have a card called Necroz of Brionic, which you can discard itself from your hand in order to add any Necroz monster from your deck to your hand. And Necroz also had a card called Necroz Kaleidoscope, which allowed you to special summon a Necroz monster from your hand by tributing monsters from your hand field or extra deck. So, if you use Kaleidoscope in order to bring out Necroz of Unicor, which is a level 4, Sending a Herald of Arc Light to the graveyard as its target, that allows you to search out any ritual monster or ritual spell card. So, thanks to the trifecta of Colossus giving you access to all other spell cards, Kaleidoscope into a Unicorn giving you access to all other spells or monsters, and Brionic giving you access to everything, it was incredibly easy to get out whatever you wanted for Necroz. And since one of those main playmakers was a level 3 monster, you could instead just choose to ritual summon it normally with Jin release or rituals as its full materials as it even had an impressive 2300 defense for a level 3 monster. So unless your opponent was able to beat over Necroz of Colossus without special summoning a monster, they were pretty much locked out of the game. And there was even protection for Necroz of Colossus, as Necroz of Tristula could be used from the hand in order to negate any card effect that would target it, and Necroz of Decisive Armor could be used to increase his defense by an additional 1000 with its hand effect, if they did manage something with more than 2300 attack, but less than 3300 attack. And Necroz of Unicorn had a passive effect to negate the effects of all monsters that were special summoned from the extra deck anyway. So if your opponent already had an answer on the board, they probably wouldn't be able to use its effect. And one last thing that made Releaser Ritual's effect so strong was the fact that it applied its effect as a lingering effect, which can't be negated. So if your opponent had something like Dark Ruler No More or Forbidden Droplets, trying to shut down all of your monster effects so they could summon, 
it actually would not negate the effect of Jin Ruli's rituals, if it was affecting one of your ritual monsters. The only way to stop it was to remove the monster from the field or flip it face down. So because a new ritual monster archetype was released that was actually good, they had to retroactively think about all of the broken ritual support they've released over the years, and Jin Ruli's rituals definitely got hit in that adjustment. Could Jin Ruli's rituals be unbanned? Probably not. Ritual decks still pop up in the meta every now and then, and giving them access to a super powerful Floodgate that can't be negated is probably not a good idea. As Floodgates themselves are just inherently unfun to play against, doubly so when you can't actually do anything about it. How could they fix Jin release or Rituals to be unmanned? Well, if they made the effect affect both players, that would definitely go a long way from not making it completely overpowered, and just simply very powerful, as it would still allow you to use it to kind of the same effect. If you bring out Herald of Ultimateness with Jin release or Rituals, it probably wouldn't matter if you couldn't special summon anymore, because you would just be able to negate anything your opponent might try to do, and you could probably win by just attacking with a vanilla beat stick. So, they would probably have to just change the effect on a whole, or at least make it more restrictive in what it disallows your opponent from special summoning. Like, maybe it only locks your opponent out of their extra deck, or only from special summoning monsters from the hand. Maybe not from the graveyard. Just something other than a full lockdown on all of your opponent's special summons. And at number 4, we have Cyberjar. This is an old flip monster from the early days of the game, which has a very weirdly overpowered effect, considering the time period this card was released. Where, when this card is flipped face up, it destroys all monsters in the field. Then it allows both players to reveal the top 5 cards in the deck, where you then special summon all level 4 lore monsters ever revealed, in either face up attack position or face down defense position. And then you just add the other cards to those players' hands. So, the fact that this card destroyed all the monsters in the field on its summon is pretty strong on its own. There aren't a lot of flip monsters that can just unconditionally destroy everything on the field when flipped face up. It also allows you to potentially summon 5 monsters from your deck, which is pretty generically super powerful. And even if you don't special summon any of them, you just get to add 5 cards to your hand, which is also a super powerfully strong effect. And it's just in addition to whatever cards in your hand, so you don't have to empty your hand like with Morphine Jar, another really strong flip monster that allows you to draw 5 cards. If you get Cyber Jar in the field and then flip it up immediately with something like A&D Changer, you get to just add 5 extra cards to your hand, while also potentially destroying all of your opponent's monsters if you're doing it going second. So you'll have up to 10 cards in your opening hand to deal with your opponent's board instead of only 5, while also being able to special summon monsters, which in itself is also a really good effect. Sure, your opponent also gets 5 cards and also gets to special summon, but you're adding 5 cards to your hand on your own terms, which is just ridiculous card advantage in Yu-Gi-Oh! Even though this card is a slow flip effect monster, it's easily the most powerful of all the very powerful Jar cards in the game. Morphing Jar, for example, is a potential plus 5 in card advantage, is limited to 1 copy, and is a baby card compared to Cyber Jar, which can blow up the field and gain you the same amount of advantage without worry for cards that are already in your hand. Cyber Jar was banned in April 2006, shortly after they created the Forbidden list. Could Cyber Jar be unbanned? Probably not, even though it's a very slow flip effect monster. The card is just a pure 5 extra cards in your hand if you don't summon the monsters with its effect, which could allow you to start the duel with 10 cards in your hand and there aren't really other cards in the game that allow you to get that same kind of setup. The way this card moves cards around is so extreme that it really stands out from other Yu-Gi-Oh cards, where being able to draw one card unconditionally is considered a powerful effect. Remember, there's a card in the game called Sekka's Light, which is only a plus one in card advantage, as it just lets you draw two cards and allows you to mulligan one card in your hand afterwards. But it has a side effect where you can't activate any other spell or traps for the rest of the duel, except other copies of this card and this card is considered so good that it's currently limited to one copy. How could they fix Cyber Jar to make it unban? Well, they could adjust its effect to be more like Morphing Jar number 2, which was another Jar card that was banned and eventually taken off the ban list because it wasn't as powerful as the others and was mainly used in inconsistent loops. Morphing Jar number 2 can shuffle all cards in the field back into the deck. Then you have the potential to summon cards equal to the amount that were shuffled back. So if Cyber Jar instead only allowed both players to summon cards from the top of their deck equal to the amount of cards that were actually destroyed on both players' fields, and also didn't allow you to keep any of the other cards, then it could probably be unbanned with no problem. There's also the fact that this card could probably be unbanned as is and wouldn't see competitive play just because it's a flip monster, which should show you something a little bit about how unviable flip monsters are. But the potential of this card is just way too strong for that, so it would need an errata. Lastly, we have Fiber Jar the other Jar card which is currently banned. This card has the full effect where both players have to shuffle all cards in their hand, field, and graveyard back into their deck, then both players draw five cards. So the card basically resets the duel, as losing all of your graveyard setup is completely detrimental to a lot of decks, 
as is losing all the cards on the field, which is bad for most decks, and of course losing all the cards in your hand, which is bad for every deck. Except for Infernities, probably. You do get to draw five cards afterward, which kind of puts the game back into the original state that you probably would start it off with, which is a huge problem if you're just playing Fiber Jar in any kind of stall deck. One of the ways to beat a stall deck is just to outgrind their card advantage. If you're using typical stall cards like Threatening Roar or Wabaku, which both have the abilities to stall at an entire turn, they are inherently limited by the fact that both of these cards are minus ones in card advantage. So, while you may be able to stall out for a number of turns using these kinds of cards, eventually some of them will be destroyed before they're used. Some of them might even be negated, and you need to win before you run out of card advantage for whatever kind of game set you're trying to achieve. Whether you're trying to survive 20 turns to resolve Final Countdown, or just long enough to draw 5 pieces of Exodia maybe. Whatever the case, being able to reset card advantage to both players is just incredibly powerful. It doesn't matter how well your opponent was playing the game and out-resourcing you, if you're able to resolve Fiber Jar, it just resets everything back to square one. And if you're playing something like Final Countdown, where all you have to do is just survive for 20 turns, that reset and card advantage can be the same thing as winning the game. Fiber Jar is another one of those where the potential of the card is just too powerful, even if the effect of the card itself is not that big a deal. If Fiber Jar was unbanned tomorrow, it probably wouldn't see any competitive play. It's kind of like Yadagarasu. But the kind of effect that it has should just not exist in the game, which is why it stays banned and was even banned before Cyber Jar, as this card was banned in April of 2005, one full year before Cyber Jar, even though both of those cards came out in the early days of the game before the ban list was created. It really goes to show that resetting the card advantage of the game is more ban worthy than gaining the ridiculous effects of Cyber Jar. Could Fiber Jar ever be unbanned? It probably could be unbanned and nobody would ever play it. But it also probably should never be unbanned without an errata, because if there is ever a deck that's able to make it viable, that would be a very annoying deck to play against. How could they fix this card to be unbanned? If they remove the effect of resetting the hands and graveyards, and just left in the effect of resetting the field, but also allow you to draw cards until you have 5 in your hand, that would probably do it. The really powerful thing about this card is resetting your opponent's graveyard in hand, as the graveyard is basically a second hand to most decks and the hand is the most valuable place you can hit with any kind of card effect, which is why a lot of cards that only discard from your opponent's hand generically are straight up banned. And the only cards that do interact with your opponent's hand usually have a bunch of requirements on how they're able to do that, and some of them only do it temporarily, while only targeting one card at a time. However, if the card was able to only shuffle all cards on the field back into the deck, it would still be a powerful effect, even if it also allowed both players to draw until they had five cards in their hand. But it wouldn't be as broken as it is currently, where it's able to target the hand and the graveyard and get rid of them. Alright, and that's the video. There's only two more before we cover all the banned cards as of whatever ban list is currently out at the time of this video's upload. 